So hello everyone and welcome to today's workshop session, Identifying COAs for Use in Rare Disease Treatment Trials. My name is Lindsay Murray and I'm the Associate Director of the PRO Consortium as well as the moderator for today's workshop, which is a joint presentation from member representatives of the PRO Consortium and the Rare Disease Subcommittee. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items so you know how to participate in today's event. Your line has been muted to reduce background noise, and the Q&A function will not be available. You will have the opportunity to submit questions for today's workshop during the Q&A session at the end of our time today. So please raise your hand and I'll call on you. Um, by You raise your hand by hitting the participant tab and then the hand icon at the lower right-hand corner. We will be recording today's presentation along with the slides. This recording will be made available on the CPAC website on the PRO Consortium webpage. Feel free to share it with your colleagues who are unable to join us today. We've included our disclaimer statement here, so just a reminder that the views and opinions expressed in the following slides are those of individual presenters and should not be attributed to their respective companies or organizations, the US FDA or the Critical Path Institute. Now I'd like to introduce today's presenters and panelists. So if you would all please turn on your cameras. Um, I'm joined today by Tori Brooks, who's a scientific research associate at MAPI Research Trust, involved in the management of literature review projects in the field of clinical outcome assessment. Kiara Bergen is a research speech language pathologist in the Department of Neurology at Virginia Commonwealth University. Naomi Noble is a reviewer in the Division of Clinical Outcome Assessment at FDA. John Phillips is a director of, clinical, director of Clinical Scientist for Outcomes Research at Regenix Bio, and Adam Shaywitz is the Chief Medical Officer at Bridge Bio Gene Therapy, uh, as well as Allison Siebold, who is a Senior Research Program Manager at the National Organization for Rare Disorders. Thank you. With that, I'm going to ask everyone to turn off their cameras now for the duration of the presentation, and we'll come back online uh, for Q&A. Today's presentation objectives are to provide an overview of the Rare Disease COA Consortium grant activities, to learn about the development of the Rare Disease COA resource, and to understand how methodological challenges to rare disease are being addressed. I will start off with providing an introduction to the Rare Disease COA Consortium and our goals. I will then provide an overview of the Rare Disease COA resource development process. Next. We will hear from Tori about the landscape and gap analysis methods and results for the daily functioning subdomains of self-care, gross motor function, and fine motor function. And then following Tori, I will speak about approaches to the assessment of clinical benefit of treatments for conditions with heterogeneous manifestations and applications in rare disease clinical trials. Kiera will then provide an update on our COVID-19 mitigation strategies in pediatric rare disease clinical trials team followed by the regulatory perspective on rare disease work with, from Naomi. And finally, we'll have a panel discussion and questions and answers from our panelists and then with the audience. So as you are all very much aware, there are more than 7,000 rare diseases worldwide. Most of these conditions are serious and many are life-threatening or fatal. Nearly 80% of rare diseases are caused by a faulty gene and a practice approximately 50% impact children. However, less than 5% of rare diseases have approved treatment. There are a number of well-documented challenges to rare disease drug development, and I'm going to focus on the selection of an appropriate clinical outcome assessment tool to measure clinical benefit of treatment. With 7,000 rare diseases, disease-specific COA development is infeasible and inefficient. Typical de novo development of a disease-specific COA can take more than 10 years with common diseases, and these timelines can be extended beyond that for the rare diseases. This is obviously not a pragmatic approach to accelerating treatments to patients who need it most. In order to address this issue, FDA's Center for Drug Evaluation and Research funded a cooperative agreement to establish the Rare Disease COA Consortium. A one-year grant was awarded to CPAS with NORD as a subawardee on September 1, 2019. A no-cost extension was approved on July 17, 2019, extending funding through August 31, 2021. 
And the specific aim of this funding opportunity was to establish a rare disease consortium focused on identifying um, COAs that could be implemented in rare disease clinical trials. Once established, the final outcome would be the creation of a common resource describing publicly available fit-for-purpose COA assessment tools, as well as accompanying information, such as the populations for use and the strengths and limitations of each tool. The first step toward the establishment of the new consortium was the creation of the Rare Disease Subcommittee within CPAS Patient Reported Outcomes Consortium. The PRO consortium serves as an incubator for the maturation of a pre-competitive multi-stakeholder consortium within CPAS COA program. Monthly rare disease subcommittee calls have been ongoing since November 2019. I'd like to take a moment to thank all of the rare disease subcommittee members who have participated in this initiative up to now. We started the rare disease subcommittee with our partners at NORD, nine PRO consortium members and representatives from the National Institutes of Health, National Center for Advancing Translation Sciences, and Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute. Subsequently, we have expanded to include an additional 25 advisory members, as well as three clinical experts who have been providing us a perspective from in the trenches, as it were, on implementing COAs in pediatric rare disease populations. And last, but certainly not least, um, I cannot emphasize enough how much the ongoing FDA support we've received have helped shape this effort with representatives from across theater providing insight and guidance on every aspect of this initiative. Members of the Rare Disease Subcommittee um, made some important initial decisions. We decided to focus our initial efforts on pediatric populations and that oncology would be excluded from these initial efforts. We also decided that a disease-specific approach wasn't going to be manageable in rare diseases, um, so we picked a domain approach that might be able to identify COAs that were fit for purpose for use as endpoint measures in treatment trials across multiple rare diseases. And the first domain of interest identified was daily function. Moving on, we developed a process for how we would go about creating this rare disease COA resource. And this is meant to be an iterative process that will continue as we build out different domains and subdomains and expand into adult populations, oncology, and other therapeutic areas. So it all begins with domain prioritization and definition, which then leads into a landscape analysis of COAs for the selected domain. And that process is a large-scale literature review where we're really trying to identify COAs that are being used not just in clinical trials, but um, COAs that might be used in clinical practice, in naturalistic studies, observational studies, to really try and identify what might be most relevant. And then have, we have some criteria for selecting COAs for then further analysis. The selected COAs are then um, undergo a gap analysis where there's really a lot of information is pulled on each individual COA and critiqued against evidentiary expectations, as well as other key considerations like patient burden and cost. We'll then be undertaking a consensus process to select COAs for actual inclusion in the resource. And as part of that process, we'll be building out contextual information for when the selected COAs may be of use to a greatest advantage. For instance, there are COAs that are commonly used in rare disease pop pediatric populations that we know have floor effects or ceiling effects, and those things would be noted in the resource. And then all of this information will be made publicly available via a website, and you'll be able to access through the CPATH um, website. So the key takeaways that I, I want to leave you with are that the Rare, Sub, Rare Disease Subcommittee is utilizing a domain approach to identify potential COAs and daily function was selected as the first domain to address. We are initially focusing on identifying COAs for pediatric, non-oncologic populations, and we are excited to work towards our official launch as the Rare Disease COA Consortium in July of 2021. Now I'll turn it over to Tori Brooks from Mappy Research Trust to go over the landscape and gap analysis methods and results for the daily living subdomains of self-care, gross motor function, and fine motor function. 
So Tori, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Lindsay, and hi, everyone. Like Lindsay said, my name's Tori, and I'm with MAPI Research Trust. I'm part of our targeted literature review team, and I'm happy to be here today to go over with you my presentation on a landscape review of clinical outcome assessments measuring daily function in pediatric populations. And this is a project which is helping to inform the build out of a rare disease COA resource, which Lindsay was just talking about. This project has been in the works for a long time, so I'm excited to be sharing this with you all and talking about the progress we've made so far. So today I'll be going through a brief overview of the project, including the objectives, a summary of the findings thus far, and an update on the current status of the project and the next steps. So the objective of the project is to perform a comprehensive landscape review to identify and summarize existing literature on clinical outcome assessments or COA measures used in pediatric populations to measure the daily function subdomains of gross motor function, fine motor function, and self-care, and to provide a detailed gap analysis of selected candidate COA measures. And to give you an idea of the scope on which we're focusing for this review, the first domain selected to focus on was daily function. And I have here the definition for daily function used for this project, which was developed by the Rare Diseases Subcommittee. So daily function is defined as common everyday actions and behaviors involving functional ability that children display to show a growing independence and mastery of skills. This is a very broad term, and there are a number of subdomains which fall under the definition of daily function. So it was decided that instead of trying to do one landscape review on the whole domain of daily function, we would just start with a smaller piece. So this review that I'm presenting on today specifically covers the daily function subdomains of gross motor function, fine motor function, and self-care. And there are already plans for similar reviews on additional subdomains of daily function, namely the communication and language subdomain. And I'll talk a little bit more about this later. So on this slide, and I won't read these out to you, but I do have here the definitions we use for each subdomain covered in this review. So self-care, gross motor function, and fine motor function. And these slides will be posted online if you would like to refer back to them and read over these at a later time. So this project was broken up into three main steps. First was the review of published studies, in which the aim was to identify COA measures which assess gross motor function, fine motor function, and self-care used in international peer-reviewed published studies in pediatric populations over the last 10 years. And we captured patient-reported outcome measures, clinician-reported outcome measures, performance outcome measures, and observer-reported outcome measures. The next step was for us to provide some guidance in the selection of a short list of candidate COA measures for which we would provide a detailed gap analysis. And finally, the third step was to perform the gap analysis by providing for each selected COA measure the documented development history, psychometric validation data, conditions of use and translations, and the review copy. So to get into the methodology of the landscape review, with input and feedback from the Rare Diseases Subcommittee, we built and refined a search strategy to use in Medline and Embase databases in order to identify the relevant published literature. The search strategy consisted of four blocks of search terms, which you can see here in numbers one through four. So we had a block for pediatric population terms, one for concept or the subdomain terms, a block for COA measure terms, and one for study type terms. The four blocks were then crossed together and a few limits were applied, and this resulted in 1,300 abstracts to screen. Concurrently, we also performed a search in the Perquala database to identify any additional relevant COA measures which were not retrieved in the literature review search. Here I have a high level flowchart of the reference screening and exclusion process with which I went through each of the 1,300 retrieved abstracts of publications, documenting the reasons of exclusion as I went. 
And as you can see on the high level chart, the screening process resulted in a final selection of 667 references for data extraction. And within the 667 references that were selected for data extraction, we also applied some inclusion and exclusion criteria to the COA measures identified in these references. We included the COA measures that were developed or assessed in pediatric populations, those that measure either of the three subdomains of interest, either as a whole measure or with a validated subscale score, and those that can be used in a generic population, while proxy reported PRO measures for children were excluded. So all in all, 278 total COA measures meeting our inclusion criteria were identified. 262 were from the published literature, three were from the Perquala database, and an additional 13 measures were included upon request from CPATH. For each of these 278 COA measures, a number of characteristics that you can see listed on the bottom half of the slide here were reported for each one, including basic descriptive information, as well as information on publications of validation, the population of development, whether or not there was a corresponding adult measure for pediatric measures, and if the COA measure had been used in a label claim. Reporting this information for each measure helped give us a good overview of all the COA measures that were retrieved in the landscape review. And this information is mainly what we went off of when narrowing down the list of COA measures for the gap analysis step. So the next step was to provide some guidance and recommendations for the selection of a short list of COA measures for the gap analysis step. To do this, my colleague Jeremy Lambert, who's a part of the ICON patient centered outcomes team, reviewed each of the 278 measures and all of the characteristics reported for each one. And in this slide here, he gave this summary overview of what was found across the measures. So you can see here, but he noted that there were both disease specific and generic instruments, adult measures which were used in pediatric populations, age specific measures for children, more broad or large spectrum tools, as well as single item and single concept measures, various parameters of daily functioning were covered, COA measures used more or less often, and different types of COA measures were found. So overall, a really broad range of COA measures were retrieved in the landscape review. In order to refine the list of 278 COA measures to something a little bit more focused, which we could perform the gap analysis on, I have some criteria listed here that Jeremy took into account to narrow down the list, and they're not really given in any specific order of importance, but he looked at frequency of use in the literature, ages and disease indication of development, subdomain specific coverage against COA content. So basically, were any or all of the subdomains assessed by a COA measure as a whole instrument or just by individual domains? A review of the scoring rules. So if there is only a global score available for a COA measure versus domain level scoring, whether or not there's published data available on the COA measures measurement properties and any information on the COA measure being used in a drug or product label claim. Okay, so now that I've gone through the project methodology, oh, sorry, I actually skipped forward a bit. Okay, so this list of 278 COA measures and all of the information reported for each one, along with some recommendations from Jeremy, were circulated among the Rare Diseases Subcommittee. And after their review of everything, we ultimately came out with a list of 49 unique COA measures selected for gap analysis with just a note that due to some of the COA measures having different versions to be described separately, a total of 53 measures were selected. For each of the COA measures selected, the gap analysis for each measure includes the reporting of the development history, psychometric validation data, conditions of use and translations, and the review copy.
So now that I've gone through the project methodology, I have a quick status update on where we currently are with the project. So since the landscape review is completed and the 53 measures were selected for gap analysis, now we're currently working on the gap analysis step. And with so many COA measures and a lot of information to report for each one, as you can maybe imagine, this is quite a bit of work and I'm really thankful to have the help of my colleagues in our databases team who have been helping with a lot of the legwork for this part of the project. And the plan for the gap analysis is that the list of 53 measures has been broken down into three packages and the results for these three packages will be delivered in three separate phases. The first phase has already been delivered and the rest of the gap analysis results should all be completed and delivered by the end of June, by June 25th. And then going back to something that I touched on in the beginning of this presentation, we do have in the works a similar review on the next daily function subdomain of interest, which is communication and language. At this point, the landscape review of the published literature for the communication language review has been completed. And we're now in the process of narrowing down the list of identified COA measures to select for the gap analysis step. So that's it for me. Uh, thank you all for listening and I'll go ahead and pass it back to Lindsay now. Thanks, Tori. So next I'll be presenting on approaches to the assessment of clinical benefit of treatments for conditions with heterogeneous manifestations. I'll start with a brief overview of the challenges with assessing conditions with heterogeneous manifestations and provide a description of the literature review methods we employed before discussing the individualized outcome strategies we identified. I'll wrap up the presentation by discussing special considerations and applications in rare disease. Oh, I think we're having a technical moment, okay. So as many of you know, conditions with heterogeneous manifestations are difficult to assess in clinical trial settings. People with the same conditions may present with different symptom and impact profiles. In addition, these profiles may change over time between and within individuals. This makes the selection of a single outcome or outcome measure that is relevant to every study participant a true challenge. While this occurrence is not found only in rare diseases, it is a common occurrence amongst rare diseases. The combination of rarity and heterogeneity can make it particularly difficult to recruit a study sample of sufficient statistical power. There have been a number of efforts over the years to develop individualized outcomes that are relevant to each participant. On behalf of the Rare Disease Subcommittee, CPATH and Evadera conducted a literature search to identify measurement approaches for addressing heterogeneous manifestations that could be relevant in rare diseases. The objectives of the study were threefold. First was to identify types of individualized assessments used to evaluate clinical benefit in conditions with heterogeneous manifestations. And then we wanted to link these measurement methods to any FDA approved label claims. We also took, wanted to highlight measurement approaches that had been used specifically in rare diseases and then also consider what other approaches could apply in rare diseases. The research team discussed various search terms, strategies, and disease areas likely to use individualized outcomes. After generating a list of likely terms, Evadera staff searched PubMed and Google Scholar for articles reporting trials where individualized outcomes were used. When such a trial was identified, Evadera examined the associated FDA-approved label to determine if the individualized outcome approach was included in the label language. As new approaches were identified, the search parameters were expanded. In total, six individualized outcome terms were identified. Multi-component endpoints, including composites, multi-domain responder index, most bothersome symptom, goal attainment scaling, gliding dichotomy, and adequate relief. The Evadera team also searched the PRO's label database, focusing on FDA labels from 2002 to July of 2020. In addition, all FDA-approved labels from 2019 to July 2020 were searched on the FDA website directly. In total, 59 individualized outcomes were identified across 
the three sources. I'm sorry, individualized um, outcomes were identified in labels across the three sources. We also identified um, a disconnect between language used to describe composite outcomes in the literature versus an FDA guidance material. The 2017 FDA draft guidance for industry titled Multiple Endpoints in Clinical Trials refers to composite endpoints as the specific use of event-based outcomes where only one of the outcome events needs to be met for the individual to be classified as a responder. So for example, death or stroke or myocardial infarction in cardiovascular studies. Other methods for combining multiple outcomes into a single endpoint are described as other multi-component endpoints. Multi-component endpoints should be designed so that all components are of similar importance to the people with the given disease. Ad hoc searches of the specific term multi-component endpoints identified no new studies. The terminology used in this presentation aligns with the FDA guidance to ensure clarity, specificity, and regulatory relevance. And we've provided a brief description of the four multi-component subtypes here, um, including time to event endpoints, using the rate of given events after a certain period of treatment or follow-up, total score endpoints, and dichotomous event endpoints. So those will be there for your reference in the slide deck. Um, in total, we identified 49 FDA-approved labels, which included composite or other multi-component endpoints. 13 of these labels were for rare diseases. Um, we found nine product labels that included most bothersome symptom, although none were for rare diseases. An FDA accepted adequate relief as an endpoint in the approval of the IBS product Lotronix, but as of the 2012 FDA IBS guidance, FDA no longer recommends its use in IBS, and no adequate relief endpoints were found in rare diseases. No FDA-approved labels included MDRI, GAS, or sliding dichotomy endpoints for either non-rare or rare diseases. So it's important to note that exclusion from an FDA-approved label claim does not directly indicate FDA's disapproval of that approach. There are a number of reasons that outcomes aren't included incorporated into FDA-approved labels, including failure to achieve efficacy or safety endpoints, lack of funding to complete the trial, protocol violations, poor recruitment, enrollment, or retention. And the results we indicate, uh, that we found merely indicate examples where these individualized outcome approaches have been successful in being included in an FDA label claim. And all of the, um, when we say included in the label claim, it's all coming from section 14 of, of the label. So there are a number of potential applications to rare disease clinical trial programs. The multi-component subtypes of rate of given events after a certain period of treatment or follow-up and time to event endpoint may be particularly useful because they allow for variability in the specific component used to signal an event. So this might be constructed in a way that's similar to what Dr. Papadopoulos discussed during the FDA updates panel yesterday for the suggested COVID-19 endpoints where multiple symptoms are evaluated and the, the endpoint is actually tied to reduction in symptoms. Um, and how you define that would obviously need to be trial specific. Multi-domain responder indices, most bothersome symptom, goal attainment scaling, and adequate relief may be applicable to specific rare disease clinical trial programs. Each of these approaches has a variety of statistical and theoretical challenges that need to be thoroughly understood and thought through. We've listed some of the biggest concerns here, but early interaction with specific FDA review divisions is key to endpoint selection and success of any of these methods. Um, Although I know that there's a lot of excitement about many of these methods in the rare disease community. So in summary, six types of measurement approaches were identified to quantify clinical benefit for conditions with heterogeneous manifestations, multi-component endpoints, including composites, most bothersome symptom and adequate relief have been included in FDA approved label claims previously. 
The remaining approaches may have applications in rare disease programs, but will require careful planning, and a manuscript describing this study is under development. So with that, I'll turn it over to Kiara Berggren from Virginia Commonwealth University for our final presentation. Great, good afternoon. Thank you so much. Um, so I have had the pleasure of working with a team um, looking at how do we conduct studies in the setting of this pandemic that we find ourselves in right now, especially in this rare disease population. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about kind of what we've been finding as part of our team and um, give you kind of a quick overview. This is actually a work in progress right now, so um, not quite the finished product, but I'll at least give you some of the highlights. So outline for the presentation today is to talk a little bit about the objectives of our team, give you an update on the status. Um, we will be hosting a workshop on this material as well. And um, I'll give you a few of our uh, team findings as we talk today. So objectives of the team when we first got together, obviously was to um, collaborate a little bit on some of the challenges that we are finding in conducting pediatric trials with these rare disease populations that we all see um, with the overlay of COVID-19 going on. And we quickly identified through our conversations um, very broad concerns in conducting trials in this setting and then um, specific ones that occur at, at specific points in the trial. So at trial startup or for trials that maybe were enrolling when the pandemic began, um, pivoting between in-person and remote assessments, uh, certainly wrapping up studies and analyzing all of the data and some of the regulatory challenges. So I'll touch briefly on some of these. Um, it wasn't enough, however, for us to just discuss the challenges. We really wanted to identify ways to mitigate this so we can all be successful at running these trials um, in the in the setting we find ourselves in now. And so we will be holding a workshop to present our findings from this team and also have an open discussion amongst stakeholders within the, the clinical trials community about other other solutions maybe people have found and can brainstorm together. So that study, or excuse me, that workshop is set for Friday, May 7th, noon to 1.30 p.m. Eastern time. Hopefully this is a time that we can get uh, international um, registration for. Uh, we would love to see everybody there. And now I'll kind of give you a little bit of an overview of where we're at with it so far. So objectives for our workshop are obviously identifying these challenges that uh, are hopefully unique well <laughs> unfortunately but unique to our pediatric population that we work with and really looking at what are some mitigation strategies in general and then drilling down a little bit and looking at mitigation strategies for assessments in particular um, remote ones versus in-person ones and then again that sort of brainstorming as a community of um, other other solution sets. Uh, we have a broad scope of experience and uh, settings that we're all in on the team, but uh, realize that we may not have all the answers. There's so many iterations out there. So look forward to some collaboration on that. So when we sat down and sort of really thought about the trial in phases, beginning trial, starting a trial up, what are some of the challenges that we identified? And again, this isn't meant to be a broad uh, or an in-depth discussion of all of our findings, but to give you a little taste of the workshop. So um, certainly we all work with these vulnerable populations and given the health risks that they have as part of their disease, they uh, most of them are wanting to limit exposure. And so, unfortunately, enrollment for trials uh, may be reduced in this setting. Um, we know internationally there's sociopolitical factors that are present um, at baseline and certainly have been exacerbated by the pandemic. And if you kind of combine these two together, so we have these vulnerable populations with very real health concerns um, and families are stressed just in um, working with their family member with their rare disease. And now we have a pandemic on top of it. It really um, challenges families to be ready to participate in these trials. And so this was a big challenge that we identified um, 
in in talking as a team. And then at least here in the US, we are finding as well that there are some there's decreased philanthropy with many of our patient advocacy groups that uh, is unfortunately perhaps impacting the ability to fund trials in these rare diseases. And so that becomes a challenge as well. When we look at the trial conduct phase, there were um, quite a few broad areas here that we have uh, really talked around, um, just as highlights, talking about study personnel and training for our study personnel. Uh, for most of us, our study coordinators and clinical research or clinical evaluators uh, go through quite a bit of training to run these studies and collect these assessments and or perform these assessments and collect data. And that training has really been challenged um, in terms of, you know, we can't get together and do it anymore. And so how do we do this remotely and how do we be flexible around this? Um, we're finding that time is a big factor for all of us in all phases of the study, but certainly during the actual study visit. Um, yeah, everything just takes longer in the setting of this pandemic, all the planning that's having to go into this. And as well, the per personal protective equipment planning around that um, logistics and the limitations of that. Certainly another big aspect of the trial conduct is the increased need for documentation um, as a couple highlights those missed visits or visits that are out of window and certainly all the deviations that are happening with the protocol um, for a multitude of reasons. Um, but if we step back a little bit and think about perhaps trials that were started before the pandemic and are currently enrolling or continuing to enroll, are the endpoints that were identified before we began, before the pandemic began, are those endpoints still reasonable in a study now, given the, the situation we find ourselves internationally with this pandemic. Um, and so stepping back and really looking at those endpoints is a, a challenge and a um, concern. So we do have a specific part of the workshop developed um, to di just discuss assessments themselves and versus in-person assessments versus remote assessments. And some of the big findings that we had chatted about as a group um, and we'll talk more in the workshop about are limitations in physical space, certainly in um, for clinical trials that are happening in hospital settings or academic institutions, uh, there may be changes and ongoing changes in terms of availability for clinical research space. Um, the effect of PPE, so if we think about some of our children with craniofacial abnormalities that maybe have difficulty wearing PPE adequately, um, or some of the um, study personnel the, uh, being able to move as well in, in all being all gowned up um, can be quite a challenge. And then there are remote assessments. So many clinical trials already have remote assessments built into them, but many of us found ourselves really scrambling when the pandemic began, not the least of which is around these technical concerns in trying to conduct assessments remotely. So access to reliable internet um, and thinking about that uh, we have at our in our clinical trials, we have trained clinical evaluators. Now we have caregivers in the home um, that are helping us with data collection. And how do we standardize this? We've gone from one trained clinical evaluator to you know, a, a number of clinical evaluators that are maybe not as standardized in their training. Um, and then how do we validate our electronic data, data capture system? Some data capture systems, electronic ones, are compliant with federal regulations and some aren't. Um, and how do we handle data capture around that? So this is a, a big area of concern and we'll talk a little bit more about it in the workshop as well. Um, in doing the assessments as well, documenting, as I mentioned earlier, all the deviations that uh, we are finding ourselves having to um, make note of. And, you know, even from down to uh, what, pro what steps can be done, what assessments can be done, as well as what PPE is in use and what are the effects of that. Um, we're also seeing that there are a multitude and varied site specific requirements around the pandemic situation. So some sites may be, especially across multi-site studies, some sites may be completely locked down, other 
areas, local areas may be more opened up and maybe have more options available for assessments that can be completed at the different sites. And so there's a lot of variability and heterogeneity in the assessments that we can complete. Certainly, one of the big questions as well that came up on our team is talking about the regulatory side of things. So um, institutional review boards or IRBs, um, certainly early in the pandemic, were many were finding themselves inundated with requests for clinical studies around COVID-19, which may have backburnered some of the other studies that were in the IRB process and slowed things down a little bit. Um, hopefully that has been mitigated in most sites at this point, but that was certainly a challenge early on. Um, and even just making sure we were communicating with the IRB about what our protocol deviations are and any modifications to documents that we needed to make to continue to be in compliance as we move forward with studies. As studies are ongoing and certainly as they're closing out and winding down, um, figuring out how to do that data analysis piece. And there were a multitude of challenges that we discussed uh, within this realm as well. Certainly the missed visits or visits out of window that I mentioned earlier, but also even if a participant is able to be out of visit, um, maybe not all assessments were able to be completed due to local regulations. I'm thinking particularly about like pulmonary function testing maybe something that is more restricted right now uh, in the setting of COVID. And so how to handle some of that missing data. A big question that came up for us and many discussions around mitigation strategies is how do we treat data that has been collected for patients in person and remotely and can these even be compared? Um, and certainly in conjunction with that, taking into account any sort of developmental, mental health, education impacts uh, that may be happening with our young people that we are uh, working with in these clinical trials. Many of us here in the US are finding that our children are not receiving um, supportive services to the same frequency in the virtual setting as they were in the in-person setting before the pandemic began and you know how to sort of roll that into the data analysis piece and account for that. And for many of us, we're working with rare diseases that aren't quite yet at the clinical trial phase. They're still in natural history studies where we're looking at what is the normal sort of trajectory of disease progression. And now we are faced with missing data or limited data. And as we pivot with those to moving towards clinical trials, how are we going to handle that missing data that we're, we're finding in the setting of the pandemic? So, as I mentioned earlier, we'll be having a workshop. Hopefully, this has given you a little taste of what we'll be talking about uh, during that workshop. Please uh, join us. Uh, we would love to hear from you, especially during the discussion at the end where we're hoping to crowdsource other ideas around mitigation strategies and challenges that people are finding. Um, we will create a document. We have a document in process right now of identifying challenges, mitigation strategies in a table that will be hosted on the PRO Consortium website for future reference. Um, and with that, I will pass the slides along. Thank you. Thank you, Tori and Kira, for your excellent overview of some of the activities we've undertaken thus far as part of our rare disease COA effort. Um, I'd like to move on now to our panel discussion. So if everyone could please turn your cameras on. I guess that means me too. <laughs> um, I'd like to first turn it over to Naomi. I'm just gonna sense from you of uh, kind of how the FDA is envisioning the rare disease COA consortium as benefiting the rare disease community. Sure, Lindsay. I think, you know, the, the rare disease drug development space, biologic development space is massive right now. We have um, a, a, a tremendous increase, frankly, in product development across the board in CEDAR. About half of our drugs, new drug approvals are in rare diseases and in CBER, about 70% of all of their new biologic approvals are in the rare disease space. And so um, FDA spends as you know, so much of our efforts and time, you know, considering the complexities of rare diseases and, you know, the, the grant program to support this important CPAP initiative um, for this 
rare disease, uh, the subcommittee that we currently have and the, you know, the initiative and consortium that you'll launch this summer comes out of years of effort to create the space for collaboration. And, you know, I think that's what I envision at least as the greatest benefit to the rare disease community just at the outset of this consortium, which is that we need this pre-competitive space to allow um, creative ideas and uh, to be productive together, to bring together clinical experts, academics, um, our pharma and biotech colleagues, COA experts, others as well, to really solve these measurement challenges. Because I think it's one of the, uh, I think maybe we can say it's an irony of rare diseases, right? There's tremendous heterogeneity within each rare disease amongst patients and uh, symptoms and disease presentation. And yet we have um, almost identical sometimes uh, COA measurement challenges across these diseases. And as we are looking at, um, you know, creating trials that are going to be, you know, reasonable and good at uh, safety and efficacy measurement, you know, we need to, to solve some of these cross-cutting COA challenges together. Um, and so I think that's the great gift of this consortium um, to do this pre-competitive work, to do it collaboratively, and to give us all this platform to create the measurement solutions that we all need to help rare disease patients uh, get the treatments that they need. I totally agree. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I'm going to turn next to my industry panelists, um, Adam Jewis and Don uh, Phillips, and ask you all, what efficiencies does the Rare Disease COA Consortium provide for those in industry looking to identify appropriate COAs for use in rare disease clinical um, programs? And, and Don, I'll start with you. I mean, efficiencies. So I think the efficiencies it creates is that we spend an enormous amount of time doing literature searches and looking for a further understanding of the psychometric properties and the application to our specific subpopulations we're studying. So having a reference or a start point in which we can begin then to answer, I think the more complex questions related to heterogeneity, but also the unique considerations we have in pediatrics. So, you know, for me, I just, I wanted to bring up one really big point that I think is so important. and. I mean, we all know that there's heterogeneity in small sample sizes in these rare diseases. But a really challenging thing is also that development differs across all of these domains at every age. And it makes um, measurement incredibly challenging. And so having a list of measures that we can say there's normative data available for these measures and they will help me to quantify the range of participate, participants in my study related to normal expectations by age is, is a huge efficiency. Um, you know, and, and with more clarity related to that, the whole idea that you can say you want to measure gross motor, but if you don't consider that the function you expect is very different for a two-year-old and a four-year-old and find a way to describe that related to the values that are generated in that measure, you're not going to be able to develop really good um, responder definitions for for your endpoint model. And so I think it just helps us within that whole process. Great. Adam, how about you? Apologies, I was on mute. Um, I would just echo um, Pretty much everything that Don just so nicely said. Um, you know, I think we're very much on the same page um, on on this. You know, when we start, we we kind of need some general roadmap, and having something that provides that roadmap is incredibly helpful because um, you just sometimes don't know where to begin. And if you have a whole menu in front of you, at least you can kind of understand. Okay, these are your options. What are some of the differences? Um, and that's hugely helpful to a team where you might be kind of new to a particular rare disease area and you say, okay, these are things that we should be thinking about. These are what we're hearing patients and their families talking about as problems, but how do we measure them? What do people use? 
what are things that have you know some semblance of rigor about them how how implementable are they and you know can you do these in a remote setting so to be able to have that readily accessible is is really huge um and you know the 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 heterogeneity issue is i think something that is also really important um to to really understand and hopefully with the right assessments done rigorously and with you know appropriate trial design um in place you can at least understand and control um you know the 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 variability or just understand it and so know whether a difference is, is due to chance or not. Um, it, it's always striking how you know you read about some of these siblings who have the same genetic um, you know makeup and have the same you know uh, mutations that are associated with disease and they can have incredibly different presentations. So um, there are a lot there's a lot we don't understand about variability. Um, and so we just have to, you know, take that into account when we design our trials. Um, and also understanding some of the novel approaches for statistical analysis or um, endpoints, some of the things that were touched on here. I know that me and, and the teams that I'm on, we've been asked uh, by associates, colleagues, well, what about this type of assessment, most, bother most bothersome symptom, uh, MDRI? These come up a lot. So, you know, having what was presented around what we do and don't know about it is also very, very helpful. Uh, so th this I, I'm sure this will be really helpful for sponsors. Great. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Don. Um, so my my third question, my third panelist, or fourth panelist, but here is, is Allison Siebold from uh, Nord. And I wanted to ask you, how does the Rare Disease COA Consortium benefit the rare disease patient advocacy community? Sure. Uh, and anytime I'm asked to provide a, a patient advocacy or perspective on a topic, I, I like to emphasize up front that yes, NORD itself is a patient advocacy organization, but as we articulate in our mission statement, we're, we're dedicated to people with rare diseases and the organizations that serve them. So as part of that, we have over 300 patient organization members and we really look to them for their perspectives on, on all things rare disease, uh, including the opportunities and the challenges that they encounter when it comes to rare disease drug development. And, and for the challenges, uh, we off, what we often hear is, is very much in line with what, Lindsay, you presented in the introduction to this session. So it could be a, a hesitancy of a medical product developer to take on uh, a challenge with rare disease clinical trials. It could be a lack of appropriate COAs for their community. Um, and these are patient advocacy orgs that, that may have external partnerships with industry, or they may actually be conducting their own research activities. So perhaps running a patient uh, registry. So when I think about the Rare Disease COA Consortium in that context, it's just, it's so exciting uh, to consider that pre-competitive setting that Naomi was emphasizing, um, where you have representatives across different stakeholder groups coming together in a collaborative way, in a way that is specifically focusing on drug development for rare diseases to really take on some of these COA issues that exist within the space. So, you know, having a dialogue about what works, what doesn't, you know, to Adam's point, what do we know, what don't we know? Um, so that we're ultimately looking across rare diseases and, and measuring things that are important to the people with rare diseases. Um, and then in turn, we're standardizing the way that the information is collected across stakeholders. We're reducing the need for proprietary measures and, and we're optimizing the ways that the studies are designed. And you know, thinking about all of that, I think it's really exemplified in the development of the RDCOA resource, um, which I, I imagine is going to be so incredibly useful uh, for the patient advocacy organizations um, applicable to both their, their internal and external research activities. And, and the example that is top of mind for me is I know that at Nord we work uh, closely with patient groups to establish registries and with this COA resource we'll be able to to point 
patient organizations that are looking to establish um, or expand their studies to explore this resource. You know, as I think both Donna and Adam said, you know, having that starting point is just um, so incredibly valuable, whether you're on the industry side of things or, or the patient ag advocacy uh, side. Great, thank you so much, Allison, and all the panelists. Um, so at this point, I'd like to open it up to questions from the audience. Um, again, if you'd like to ask a question during uh, today's session, uh, please open your participant uh, list, and then you'll see on the lower right-hand side, there's a small hand, and you can raise your hand. We won't be using the Q&A uh, Q function uh, to enter You'll, so these questions will all be verbal. Um, and there are over 200 people attending right now, so we'll do our best to get through as many questions as we can during the allotted time. Um, and but, uh, when we call on you, please, um, you, the host will unmute your line, and when you hear two beeps, you can state your name, affiliation, and then proceed with your question. So I see the first hand raised here is Vivian Shi. So Vivian will have the host unmute you, and you can go ahead with your question. Hello, I'm Vivian Shi. I work at Patient Centered Science at AstraZeneca. Um, my question kind of ties in with what Dawn kind of mentioned to, and apologies if, I, if this was mentioned during the session, but I was wondering if anyone in the, the working group could provide some insight on the thinking behind choosing to focus on pediatric COAs in the rare disease space versus, you know, specific therapeutic areas or the adult population especially since there could be like additional intricacies to consider for pediatric reporting um, on top of this heterogeneity issue in rare diseases. Don, do you want to take it? Sure. I mean, I think it's really important that we invest the time in truly understanding the unique considerations related to children. And as we saw, over 50% of the rare diseases we're currently studying right now are pediatric conditions with a large portion of them being gene therapy. And so I think it's a really complicated and challenging topic that um, is layered by the development piece and coming together as a group to start with some small domains within that, I think will be incredibly um, helpful. And so I, I think that's, that's really the reason is the challenges really in understanding how to deal with different function by age um, and across multiple domains in these diseases. So Naomi might be able to. Yeah, yeah Naomi, do you have any Dawn, <laughs> I do. And Dawn, you know, I think you either said this directly or alluded to it in, in your comments. It's, I think one of the great complexities of pediatrics is that the concept of interest really does shift and change as children grow and develop. And so, you know, what we might be thinking of even in terms of growth motor functioning, for example, for someone who's six months old, isn't necessarily um, even the same or expressed in the same way as someone who's 12 years old. And so, um, you know, because the concept of interest is um, ever evolving as kids develop, um, it makes it, it adds to the layers of complexity in measurement. And, you know, frankly, as a, as a consortium and, and for this project, we had to start somewhere. And so uh, we decided to tackle complexity first, um, but that doesn't mean uh, that we, we leave out other populations necessarily. It's just we did have to choose a starting point. Yes, and I think you know what, what I heard in initial conversations with all the stakeholders as well was um, pediatrics was really where folks felt there was the greatest need. Um, but there are in, in adult populations, not always, but there more so there are COAs available in adult populations um, that just were lacking in pediatric populations. And that identification of tools that could be useful in across multiple rare diseases, um, but that information was lacking. Um, I think the other thing to consider here in rare diseases, a lot of companies are very, very small. Um, they're not, um, they don't have they don't always have the resources to have large outcomes um, departments with folks really dedicated to COA research. And so I think um, one of the things that I know came up in our, some of our early discussions was really trying to help some of these really small companies that are focused specifically on rare diseases, um, kind of giving them a, a leg up and, and helping them get to the right place with COA selection 
um, because it is very complex and, and, and so many submissions are being made right now to FDA, as Naomi, you mentioned, and um, it doesn't do us any good if they're not measuring the right things in the right way. Um, so really, yes, we had to start somewhere. <laughs> so yes, we did, I, you know, we bit off a, a, a big bite here, <laughs> and there's uh, certainly a lot of complexities, but um, I think it actually, from my perspective, has also underscored the value of having this collaborative, um, having this opportunity to collaborate across so many different groups and stakeholders. All right, um, so Vivian, if that answered your question, you can put your hand down. And uh, the next question is from uh, Jenya Anatova. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you very much for the great presentation. Um, and I wanted to follow up on the presentation uh, by Dr. Brooks. And the question actually by Dr. Uh, is for Dr. Noble. So I was very interested to see that there is great effort now being made to understand the landscape of uh, core instruments available for physical function assessment in pediatric rare diseases. And I certainly believe it will greatly benefit um, the patient and um, uh, research community. And my question is, uh, what sponsors should it anticipate from the FDA review standpoint if they choose one of those instruments that is um, has been discovered or outlined as a result of this effort and they decide to apply to a specific rare disease and pursue label language? Could you please um, indicate what should be expected from the FDA review standpoint in this circumstance? Thank you. Sure, that's a great question. You know, I I think my panelist colleagues here, Adam, uh, Don, Kira, and others have indicated that this review is a, a point of efficiency for all of us. Um, and I think they all even use that word and, and I would echo that too. You know, I think um, as you're considering your, your trial and coming to the agency to discuss how you're com composing your endpoints and uh, putting things together, you know, again, this compendium will be an efficiency, but um, rather like the COA compendium that we put together initially many years ago, uh, it's not a, it doesn't ever replace talking directly with patients and caregivers to understand their experiences, their treatment priorities, and it isn't um, FDA signing off on all of these COAs to say, oh yeah, these are absolutely great for uh, drug development. Uh, because this is not a drug development tool qualification review. This is a landscape review, so we can see, um, you know, what some of the strengths and limits are of the tools that are already existing. Uh, but I also hope for this project that we can identify the gaps, um, the absolute um, absence of some uh, COAs that I think would be incredibly useful, um, you know, in across many drug development programs. Um, so to answer your question, I think, um, to sum up my thoughts here, then it's I'm not entirely sure this changes anything as you come to the agency for review. Um, although I will say a shout out for reviewers, I think this is a point of efficiency for us as well. <laughs> and um, you know, hopefully we can all um, advance our conversation and, and hopefully identify COAs that are really appropriate or uh, potentially could be modified again, just in a faster way to, to get everybody underway with their programs. Can I add a point to there? Um, I think what's important in industry is not that we focus on we found the perfect COA initially, but that we do the foundational work and go back to the roadmap to clinical outcome assessment, development and selection that the FDA you know, provides. And really, regardless of whether you know that this clinical outcome assessment is appropriate for these disease concepts and for this age, go back and make sure you truly in great detail understand um, the disease present, the change in the disease on standard of care treatment. Um, Oh, the patient's the patient perspective and expert clinician exp, um, perspective on that disease, and build your conceptual model, and then figure out what is our unique treatment and how does it relate to the real context of use, and then you move into selecting which one of those COAs may be appropriate and how the psychometric properties 
that may be available to us now easier are applicable to that very specific subgroup that you defined. But do your work, do your early work to really prepare and know that you're going in the right direction and you can answer all those things and put them in an evidence dossier for the FDA from the get go. So that, that was my FDA. Thank you, Dondo. I think that's a great perspective. Any other panelists want to chime in? Nope. All right. Um, then, Jenya, you can go ahead and put, put your hand down. And our next question is from Jessica Markowitz. Oh, Jessica, are you there? Oh, she may be having trouble unmuting. Jessica? Oh, okay. Well, I'll move on to an, another question for now, and then um, if we can get Jessica unmuted, <laughs> we'll give her a chance to ask her question. Um, so one of the questions I had for the panel is, uh, what do you think some of the next methodological challenges that the rare disease COA consortium might be able to tackle are? Well, I mean, I, I think there's one, you know, very topical, um, uh, issue that I know we've had some discussions around and I'll just bring it up here because I, I think this is very relevant is, you know, how, how might we best um, translate some of these assessments that we're thinking about and evaluating um, into what might be most appropriate for remote assessments in a time where we can't travel, we've had limitations on traveling. Um, what are some of the ways that we can incorporate what we learn and the information that we're pulling out um, during this activity and then, you know, putting on a lens of, okay, which are most or least amenable to, um, you know, not to having less in-person, um, you know, uh, assessment. So what can you do remotely? What can you do over um, video assessment and, and then why? Because I think that will be very, very helpful. I think we're all moving towards a world where we're trying to do more remotely. So it seems like a natural extension of this effort to kind of apply that lens to to what's emerging from the COA analysis. Great. And so here I feel like that's going to come back to you as our our person who's actually applying these COAs in clinical practice now. Um, that's going to circle back to uh, me coming back to you to ask, you know, what are some of these criteria? What are some of the things that you found worked and what didn't work? Um, and I know some of our other clinical experts have talked about that as well, you know, ma mailing packages of, um, you know, they needed to do a walk test. I think um, one of our clinical experts mentioned, you know, their team would send a, a, a piece of yarn with 10 meters, uh, that was 10 meters long and, and instruct parents to tape it down on the carpet so that they could time the child while it, the child was walking. And, you know, just some of the things that they, the creative yes. ways that they were using to try and get this data and, and make it as reliable as possible. Right. I, I feel like that's really the big challenge right now is um, trying to figure out how to take the assessments that we've been using for years and years and, you know, modify them for um, administration in the home environment. And I think what I'm hearing from my colleagues where I work um, in running some of our trials is that, you know, maybe we aren't necessarily assessing the right things, the things that are the most important for the child in the home as well, too. So I think that it's going to be dual fold, you know, how can we take what we are using now and modify and have it be um, reliable and valid and that's going to just take testing. Um, I know we've talked about, you know, doing small samples where maybe we have the child in the home and come to clinic um, and do the same assessment and look at reliability. Um, but I think we're going to see the landscape really open up too in terms of uh, maybe some other measures that come out of all of this that are, are even more important for the, the patient and their families. That's a great, 
Oh, go ahead, Don. Yeah, so on a different note, I think the consortium, from my perspective, would be it would be really beneficial to once we learn more about MDRI and com composite endpoints to then take the next step to say, what does that mean for our populations? How will we define clinically meaningful responder definitions? Um, and how does that differ for a young child who may be functioning within normal at baseline and another child who may have a lot of deficits at baseline? Because I, I think our challenges aren't done. I think we're not gonna be able to find one piece of a definition that is across our populations that we're studying many times. So I guess I'm looking for even the layers of complexity and support because of the unique opportunity that we have to have so many, so many stakeholders in this conversation. So I think that's a great point, Don. And it's certainly, um, you know, earlier this this um, past winter, we had uh, RJ Worth, who I believe is online actually, um, come and speak to the group about most bothersome symptom and some of the statistical modeling he's done using that kind of endpoint in rare diseases. Um, and, I, you know, I think it would be great to have other groups come and, and speak to some of those points um, because certainly we're not the experts in it, but having everybody come together and having everyone together as kind of a captive audience, um, I think it's certainly a great time to, to educate all of us on some of the complexities related to these, these approaches um, because Yes, sir. There really are. It's um, you know, I know MDRI and most father systems have a lot of excitement about them, but there's a lot of theoretical and statistical complexity as well. And you know, working through those um, together is certainly something that I can I definitely see the consortium working on moving forward. Absolutely. I I also sort of see this as a really good chance for us to step back and and engage really a lot more with our patients and say what what really is the big concern for you in the home setting and how do we measure that? Um, so I think, I think there'll be some big changes, hopefully. Yes. And I, I, you know, I think I certainly see as part of the consensus process um, that we're going to build into this resource is, is having patient advocates participate in that and having them at the table with us to say, you know, this, 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 you know, this COA, I've, I've used it in trials, I hate it, it takes forever, you know, it doesn't measure anything that I feel is relevant, that kind of information that we can really only get from them um, is certainly something that I'm, I'm hoping to incorporate as we move forward. All right, we're going to try, Jessica, we're going to try to see if you're still there and if, if you want to ask your question now. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, good. Okay. I'm sorry about that. So I'm Jessica Markowitz. I am from Modus Outcomes. And my question is for Tori. Um, I think it's so great that you guys are undertaking this huge effort uh, for, you know, identifying COAs in pediatric rare disease. And I noted that you talked about a lot of the different criteria that you were going to use to, um, you know, make recommendations. But one that I didn't see was actually reviewing the items of these COAs, because as we all know, sometimes, um, you know, you know, COAs purport to measure certain domains, but if you look at the actual items, the concepts don't quite match up. So I was wondering how you're planning on addressing that. Yeah, so I will just say that you're right, that that's not something that was explicitly included. And I think maybe part of that is just because there were so many COA measures retrieved and it, it really just would have taken um, a long time to go through the item content of each one. And so I'm not sure Maybe Lindsay, you have some insight on that from your side. Sure, I think you know another one issue there too is just because of the number of of COAs that we've been looking at. Not all of them are publicly available um, for us to actually look at. We can't get a copy of the license. Many of them are licensed and copyrighted, and you know you have to actually sign a license agreement to even see the the tool. Um, so it's not always possible. So the criteria that we created as a group were really limited to what we could assess across all of the instruments consistently, and we knew we weren't going to be able to, to always get that item level detail um, on, on each COA to evaluate. But I, I think your point, Jessica, is, is very well made that, you know, it does matter what the items are, and, and you know, in some cases, Specific items may be helpful 
but the other items aren't. And, you know, I know that there's, um, there's been a lot of, I think, narrowing of the, the focus to specific tasks in some cases or specific activities rather than kind of these more broad overarching kind of tools that are measuring physical function at a very high level. Really, there's been, you know, winnowing it down to things like ability to sit up at six months. Yes or no, and and so there, you know, that in, in many cases in rare disease, and particularly I think in, in trials where you're you're looking at possibly curative effects, um, the the larger kind of overall COAs aren't always going to be what's most useful. They're not going to be sensitive enough to pick up um, all of the the activity. You know, really, what might be most useful is could the child sit up at six months for you know normal progression of diseases? No, they would not be able to. Um, Adam, did you want to add anything? No, I think you that, that that's very relevant, you know, and um, I, I don't have anything specific to add to that. Okay, <laughs> sorry, I thought I saw you. <laughs> I don't mind. No, um, I'm but agreeing. I think that it, yeah, <laughs> that is something that we're very aware of as we are looking at these COAs and. Um, honestly, I think it's something that's been a real challenge during the COA selection because, um, the, as Tori mentioned, the, the landscape analysis for the communication um, subdomain of daily function has been completed. And, you know, we were surprised to identify another 278 COAs there. Um, and so whittling that down to something that's really practical and usable to even assess in a gap analysis has been a real challenge. Um, to, to really kind of what we're finding is, you know, and this isn't a surprise, but what we're finding in many cases is because for some of these subdomains, there's not kind of a st one standard gold standard tool to use. A lot of people are developing their own tools to measure the same things over and over again. And so they all pop up in the literature once. Um, and there's, there's some real challenges for us to, uh, to tackle collectively um, around figuring out which of those tools is really kind of up to snuff and which of them may fall a little short of evidentiary um, guidelines and, and expectations. So, Lindsay, I can add to that too. When we're using these more generic um, clinical outcome assessments that cover a range of developmental ages and domains, we still have the responsibility to take our key disease concepts that are defined and take the concepts that um, parents or patients have defined as being meaningful to them and map them against the individual items on the measure to support that that measure in itself is valid for our subpopulation. So even though it's written that that's, you know, it's capturing the key concepts, you still have to support the direction you're taking and your rationale for, for specifically choosing that. Like, how many gross motor developmental things does it contain? Does it look at the same the specific speech concepts that are important to to your treatment? Um, so you don't get away with not doing that work. It's just giving you a starting place to do that mapping exercise. That's a great point, Don. Yes, and and the rare disease COA resource is really meant to be a starting place, not kind of an ending point. You know, it's not going to be an off the shelf ready for everybody to use across all rare diseases. It's, exactly as Don is describing it, you know, really um, as the starting place that this, now you have a list of three tools that are measuring, that they purport to measure the concept of interest that you have. So then it's in, incumbent on the sponsors to go and, and potentially license all three tools and see which one really aligns with what you're measuring specifically. Okay, um, so we have now have a, one more question from uh, Robin Kovinsky. I'm sorry, I always mispronounce your last name, Robin. <laughs> so we'll have the host unmute you and you can ask your, your question. That's okay, it's a rough for, one. <laughs> yeah. I've only known I, you 20 years, but I, I know. can't pronounce Hello, your last friend. <laughs> Uh, this is Robin Pochavinsky. Uh, I'm a senior research scientist at Evadera's Patient-Centered Research Group. My question is about qualitative data collection in the trial context, um, and specifically serving for a within patient meaningful treatment benefit. So I think today's panel discussion really highlights the critical importance of 
qualitative data and really getting an insight from um, the patient's perspective. Could the panel speak to the use of qualitative interview data, baseline and end of treatment or exit interview data to evaluate treatment benefit? Sure. Um, hey, Robin, it's Naomi. Hey. And uh, we all know that, you know, although I work at FDA, I do not speak for the agency. Um, so <laughs> there's my caveat. But, you know, I think I love what you're tapping into here. And I think there's, uh, especially in the rare disease space, there's such a, a great role for qualitative research. And I mean, gosh, it, if, if your study design can support it, an exit interview really can go a long way. Um, you know, when we are talking about looking at meaningful change or detecting treatment benefits that might not have been picked up in COAs or maybe even safety signals that uh, we're not capturing elsewhere in a study, but patients can tell us in an exit interview. Um, I think that's a, you know, there's that great, I think it's in a sport paper that uh, Katie Benjamin's first author and Margaret Vernon's on it and a lot of other people that came out a couple of years ago. And, um, you know, there's a there's so much value to be derived from those exit interviews alone um, that I think it's potentially underutilized. I mean, nothing can save, <laughs> no one piece of data can save a whole study, but um, I think that would be a great way to go. Uh, to your question about maybe longitudinal uh, qualitative interviews, that's, um, you know, I think that's a point of more methodological exploration and, um, there's, depending on your study design, maybe it could be warranted. And it's one of those pieces of data collection that I think um, as a research team, you'd wanna be really methodologically thoughtful, right? Like what are the potential risks? Could you potentially, uh, if it's a blinded study, could you maybe unblind patients? If it's a single arm open label study, um, you know, could in the interview process, a patient ask your interviewer a question like, hey, how are all the other patients that you've interviewed doing? And um, accidentally um, influence the patient or the study in some way. Um, you know, questions of methodology could also be like, how are you maybe biasing the sample? Like, are you inviting everybody in the study to these interviews? Is it just a small sample? How are you justifying that? Is it a burden to patients? And my experience has been that patients love it, but, um, you know, so I think those are all things that you need to consider and, and speak to, um, to, you know, argue um, and justify the idea of inclusion. But um, when things can be done in a methodologically rigorous way, you know, this is the whole point of patient experience data. And I think this is a, an ongoing kind of moving target and we're all collaborating to figure out how to do it best. Um, so it's a, a pretty broad landscape, I think, for including data and qualitative data as part of that data. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I can also add that um, the complexity sometimes of the qualitative work um, is a lot for small companies um, within a clinical trial. So we've also been looking at um, generic assessments like the Vineland, for example, that provide a semi-structured interview guide for caregivers and standardized answer format um, that allow us to get the caregiver perspective across multiple domains, but to do it in, in a standardized way, especially in an open label arm where the parents are know what treatment group obviously they're in. And um, it allows the questions to be asked in a very specific and standard way without without bias. And so um, it's it's certainly different than pure qualitative work, but it's providing us with kind of a middle ground to really find a way to get the, a lot of opinions across daily activity from caregivers. So. Yeah, and just, just to echo Don's comments and also what Naomi alluded to as well, the, the real challenge in study design and confounding in you know, ultra rare disease where the impact might not be something where um, cessation of therapy would lead to a very rapid change in um, phenotype. So it may not be amenable to a randomized withdrawal type setting where things will change and you can give therapy change 
Um, and given the, the ultra rare nature of a lot of the diseases that we work on, it may be very challenging to do um, a good placebo or randomized uh, controlled study um, there, even if you you try to control for matching baseline characteristics, is very challenging. So most people will tend to go for open label design. So if you have an open label design and changes um, don't happen very quickly, it's going to be very hard to really control for all to to choose a, another aspect of the design that will allow you to control for some bias and qualitative feedback. But I I do think it's important to include. But th those are some of the challenges that have prevented, um, you know, sponsors from including them as as sort of secondary or, or primary endpoints for efficacy. Thank you both. And Tira, I'm curious as someone who's kind of in the clinic practicing um, and working on these trials, um, do you see kind of this qualitative piece added to trials um, it very often? I honestly haven't yet. I think this is a great opportunity to really add that in. Um, even just speaking clinically, when I see patients, um, you know, I get a lot more info about what they what they actually are doing at home, um, and that sometimes sparks that idea of, oh, okay, well, maybe we can look at this down the road with with the patient population as a whole. But unfortunately, I'm not seeing it rolled out into studies just yet. But Sure. And Allison, I wonder if this is something that um, could occasionally be kind of kicked back to patient registries um, to just get, you know, if, if a sponsor is working with a, re a particular patient advocacy group and working in the registry, you may actually even be able to do kind of a control arm of people enrolled in the study versus not. Um, Yes, absolutely. Um, and I, I love the word that Kira used opportunity. I think I think this really could be quite exciting uh, moving forward. And as I think Naomi said, I think the interest from the patient community would would be very strong. Um, you we find you know, not in a clinical trial context, but just through Nord's advocacy work, we have a lot of opportunities for folks to share their stories. And, and anytime we put out a call like that, it's really um, such a robust response. I, you know, particularly in on a rare disease journey, people can be used to, you know, being passed along from you know provider to provider. They're they're looking for someone who will listen. Um, so if if there's if they're participating in a clinical trial and then they could add, you know, whether it's peer qualitative or as as Don was saying, semi structured, some additional insight about about their journey and their experience, um, it, it it would be wonderful. Well, and and my hope along those lines too is that we're going to reach a broader audience within these specific patient populations, right? We know that we're already selecting um, through self-selection, uh, you know, patients that are willing to participate in trials, and hopefully now we can kind of broaden that, especially with the um, what I see on the horizon of the increase of remote assessments and that ability to to not have patients to have to travel to a center that's you know 300 miles from their home or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that gets back to Adam's point about, you know, kind of trying to assess which 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 DOAs may be more um, amenable to remote assessment. And and I will say from looking at the communication landscape analysis results, um, some of the some of the um, licensed distributors are actually starting to add that as a field to the, their instruments. Is you know this tool is blah 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 items and you know has this many translations and there's also additional help for remote assessment now um, which I think it does show Kira that it's, it's really pushing in that direction that this is something people think is going to stay okay well I don't think we have any more questions then and we're, we're coming to the end of our time so I just want to thank all of my panelists Tori Kira Naomi Allison Don and Adam thank you so much and, and thank you everyone for attending today's workshop. Um, if you have any questions about anything we've discussed here today or the Rare Disease COA Consortium, please contact either myself or Barbara Brandt at the email addresses shown here. We are actively recruiting members for the Rare Disease COA Consortium.